take our Bibles and uh, turn to Acts. Again, we are picking up where we left off this morning, and uh, hopefully um, some of that made sense to you. Uh, if it didn't make sense to you, go see Laura, because she wrote the message. <laughs> no, not, not really. But uh, uh, just, I, I realize that oftentimes we, especially when I'm doing more of a teaching aspect, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I might get a little caught up in my teaching and I, I just, I love it. It's so, it's so, it's so wonderful. Not my teaching, okay? I wasn't meaning that. You can amen that fact that my teaching is so wonderful, but I won't. But, um, but just the fact that it, it just gets going and it gets exciting. I don't want anybody to get confused about something or uh, if I, uh, you know, maybe speak too fast over something. But hopefully the PowerPoint helps at least get some of those main points. And, and especially when we get into the theology of Acts, um, then uh, obviously I'm just putting the title of that theology in there. I'm not giving you uh, all the extra uh, notes that I have. But uh, hopefully it'll help at least make sense, uh, giving us kind of a, a more cohesive idea behind uh, the book of Acts. And so, uh, if you're able to stand with me, uh, would you stand and uh, we'll read from Acts chapter number 1. And I actually am going to jump towards the middle section here. Verse number 12, the Bible says, Then returned they... Unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James, and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the obedience of these disciples. Father, as Luke is writing about what happened on that day, as Jesus would instruct them to remain there in Jerusalem, God, we're thankful that they would spend that time in prayer. And Lord, looking forward to the fulfillment of the scripture. God, we're so thankful for the scriptures. I pray that it would give us, Lord, an increase of faith. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to learn and to grow and to, uh, Lord, really see how all of this fits together in your perfect plan. Again, we thank you for this time. Pray now and ask for your rich blessing as we study your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Acts chapter 1 uh, kind of is a little bit of an introduction uh, to what is getting ready to unfold. And again, as we've already studied uh, so far this morning, the fact of what this title means and the things surrounding the title, who the author is, who's writing uh, this letter, and uh, why this is so important. And again, this is a letter from Luke to Theophilus to strengthen the faith of Theophilus. We're not uh, told what's going on in Theophilus' life. Certainly we can probably uh, pick and choose a few different things perhaps that, that happen and come up, especially when uh, Luke writes to him about the persecution. So perhaps maybe Theophilus has been persecuted. We don't know exactly what's going on, but we do know that Luke is writing to Theophilus in order to strengthen his faith. We talked about the time of the events surrounding this book. 
about a 30 some year period of time. Uh, we talked about uh, when this book was written. It was written prior or at least 64 AD, no later, just based upon the fact that there are things uh, from a historical data point that Luke did not record in there, which is probably because they didn't happen. And then we started with the theology. And again, we want to make sure that our theology is driven by the text. The text should not be driven by our theology. Just always keep that in mind. Be willing, and let me, let me say this, this is a scary thought. Be willing to change your theology if the text tells you to. The text should always be the primacy, the primary aspect. That if we're looking at the scriptures and we think, wow, you know what, I think I've seen this wrong for all of these years, whatever it might be. Man, I need to change my theology. Do not ever allow your theology to be the king. The theology is always queen. Text is always king. All right? So we talked about two main uh, theological points here. We talked about theology proper. That is the simple study of, of the doctrine of God. We talked about Christology. Christology is a major component throughout uh, the book of Acts. A third major component, and perhaps maybe the major, major component, and that is pneumatology. Pneumatology is simply the study of the Holy Spirit. The word pneuma, referring to the spirit, the, the, the breath, uh, sometimes you see it as wind. And obviously, when we put it in theological terms, we're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you will find throughout the book of Acts, again, perhaps maybe this book could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because there's so much written in here regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You will find the filling of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 13. You will find the Spirit of God giving tongues to men, meaning languages. It's the Greek word glossa. We'll get into that, especially when we start in Acts chapter 2 or start uh, studying Acts chapter 2. We'll see that word is glossa. It's really the idea of a language, right, versus uh, just a tongue. It's, it's meaning the tongue of a native language or of a native people. And uh, we see that, that, that. How does that happen? By the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You find healings here where somebody is not just being raised from a, a crippled state, but even raised from the dead. And what is the Spirit of God that gives that life uh, to that individual? You find uh, the, the ministry of receiving the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, they would ask the question, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? Have you received the baptism of the Spirit yet? Right, these are important things. And these are doctrines that, that obviously you have people who are born again Christians that have different views regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And again, we want the text to show us what it means, not our theology. So we've got to be very careful of that. We see illumination by the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that illumines the heart and the mind of an individual so that they can be saved. We find the Spirit's work of regeneration, giving life or birthing life, breathing life into uh, individuals. And what a tremendous doctrine that is. And again, I'm not going to necessarily point out these doctrines as we're studying them, but we will know as we are studying the text of Scripture what these doctrines are. Entail. The fourth uh, uh, doctrine that we will see through the study of the book of Acts is the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. There is a lot of talk. There is a lot of discussion. There is a lot of disagreement regarding the doctrine of salvation. There is the debate between what we would call Arminianism versus Calvinism. How does a person get saved? Right? There are people who will say people get saved because of the work of God only. There are some people that say no people are saved because they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ only. And what we're going to see the text of the scriptures telling us is that no, both are essential. 
And we'll see that again. This is a theology, this is a doctrine that is much debated. Very hotly and uh, heated debates go along with that. Right? And uh, again, I'm not going to get into, okay, do you believe in the doctrine of election? What do you mean by predestination? What do you mean by foreknowledge? All of these wonderful words, but we'll study them as we come across them in, in the text of Scripture. We have the forgiveness of sins brought up through the book of Acts. What does it mean? What, what are people longing for? They're longing for their sins to be forgiven. Why? Because they're guilty. You think about our society today. What is it that people are longing for? They're longing to rid themselves of guilt. They feel guilty about things. And where do they find forgiveness? Where do they find healing? Well, the scriptures are going to teach us by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we will see that, uh, the, uh, the, the forgiveness of sin. Conversion. How does conversion take place? Obviously, Acts chapter 9 is one of the most powerful uh, studies on conversion. The road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9. How in the world did Saul of Tarsus become the apostle of the Gentiles? There is a conversion experience. As a matter of fact, people even use that term. Even unsaved people use that term. Why? Because they know that there is a huge turnaround. And they will say, hey, have you had a Damascus Road experience? Even though they're not even Christians, they have no idea. But that's become a, a known statement or at least a, 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 a theology built on that. Uh, the salvation regarding the doctrine of Christ alone. That there's no other means, there's no works that are guaranteed. We see that as we study the book of Acts. How about faith? Where does faith come into play in a life of believers? Regarding the matter of salvation, where, where does that play? We have numerous chapters over and over regarding this. How about the deliverance that comes about? Uh, how about the, the doctrine of cleansing, the doctrine of eternal life and everlasting life and joy that comes about? How about the doctrine of justification and separation and uh, redemption and sanctification and purification and glorification? These come or are found in the book of Acts. Tremendous study of the doctrine of salvation. The fifth doctrine we find in the book of Acts is the doctrine of ecclesiology. That is the, the matter of the church. And obviously, it's a book about this, right? I mean, this could even be Acts of the Early Church. Could be a good title of this book as well. Because that's what's going on. The church has been birthed. We find this in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. What a profound birthing that takes place in Acts chapter 2. And... I think if we are to be realistic about studying this and, and really desiring to learn and to grow and to say, God, is this what the church looks like today? Uh, I mean, obviously, there are some things that we're going to see in our study in the book of Acts that we're going to realize were only intended for that period of time. And we'll see that. But, but we see the, the, the doctrine of, of the church. We see their responsibility of going out and being witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world. We see the matter of prayer oftentimes coming up through uh, the book of Acts. Matter of fact, over 25 times there are references to the matter of prayer. You want to learn how to pray? Study the book of Acts. It's a great book on prayer. How about ministry, serving one another? Where does this come? Well, it comes from the book of Acts. How about the ministry of preaching? Right? Why is preaching so important? Well, you will see that throughout our study of the book of Acts as the Apostle Paul, of course, is going forth from city to city preaching the word of God. The matter of baptism. Jesus taught them back in Matthew chapter 28. You are to what? Go and baptize these people. Well, now we see the fulfillment of that in the book of Acts. Where do we get the matter of that we should baptize by immersion. We find some of that found in the book of Acts. Why we practice immersion and not pouring or sprinkling. How about miracles? How about giving? Offerings? 
How about persecution and dealing with persecution? How did the early church handle this? How about, how do you rejoice in the midst of suffering? You'll see that in the book of Acts. How about the, the fact of missions? What is missions all about? We're getting ready as a church to have a missions conference. Why do we do that? Because we see it in the book of Acts. There's a lot of things regarding the matter of the church found in the book of Acts. Uh, next uh, doctrine that we find is the doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine of last things. We will find references to the kingdom of God. What does this mean? What does this look like? What does this refer to? We see the doctrine regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see the doctrine regarding the day of the Lord. Peter uses that as, as part of his sermon. We find the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. We find judgment coming out or coming forth on them who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. We find the hope of God's promise. We find the hope of Israel as a nation once again found where? In the book of Acts. Tremendous doctrines. The seventh doctrine that we find in the book of Acts is the doctrine of bibliology. That is the doctrine of the Bible. God breathing out His Word. God giving us His Word. And you will find references to the law. You will find references to the Scriptures. Chapter 17, one of the uh, familiar passages regarding uh, the Berean church was what? And they studied the Scriptures. They were very noble people, desirous to study the Scriptures. And we learn how to do this from the book of Acts. We learn about prophecy regarding the book, uh, or found in the book of Acts. We find word of truth in the book of Acts. These are important things that, that we're going to come across. This is an important book to study because it teaches us what we believe about these things. There's then the study of the doctrine of sin, or hamartiology, from the, the Greek word uh, hamartia, which is, which is the idea of sin. We find judgment of sin. Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> Aren't you thankful that that's not happening today? Lying? Phew. Judgment of God falls. Well, there might be some aspect of that. How about idolatry? You'll find idolatry throughout the book of Acts. You'll find idol worship. You'll find heresy in the book of Acts. You'll find uh, the, the, the matter of, of obeying the authorities over us in the book of Acts. These are important things. This is where we learn how we are to identify in, and how we are to live and conduct ourselves within the society that we live in. That's found in the book of Acts. Why do we need civil authority? I love it. Um, you know, people think, why do we need government? What's government for? Government is really intended to do what? To do one thing, and that is to punish evil, to keep evil from society continuing on. And yet we find government in all different kinds of things. Right? Government's involved in our health care. What? Where did this come from? Government's involved in what kind of toilets you can have in your house. What? Where did this come from? I don't see that in the book of Acts. Right? I mean, it's, it's interesting that you have some of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, why do we believe? Where do we stand? Why do we stand where we stand? Well, we have the Word of God. And God's Word is given to us in order to instruct us in some of these matters. Right? Regarding the doctrine of sin. How about the doctrine of angels? Angelology. Angelology is found in the book of Acts. It's interesting because we don't have a lot of talk today in, in our circles on this matter of angels. Do we experience angels? I believe we do. I believe we do. I believe that there are times that you and I probably entertain angels unawares. We're unaware. And as we get into the doc or into the book of Acts, we're going to see angels come up. And how they come up and why they come up and, and the importance of them. You have the doctrine, lastly, the doctrine of demonology. Perhaps we could squeeze that under angelology just as long as we distinguish them as fallen angels, right? But demonology, the doctrine of Satan and demons. We'll find that in the, the book of Acts and how Paul comes across demons. 
do you and I come across demons? We probably never give it any thought. Matter of fact, on Wednesday night, I've been going through this matter of our warfare and, and why Paul instructs the Ephesian believers to put on the armor of God. Why? Because we, we are battling, we are in a match against spiritual wickedness in high places. You better believe we deal with demons. But yet, we don't necessarily talk about it a whole lot. And so as we get into the book of Acts, we're going to see, we're going to talk about Satan and his cohorts, those who come after us, and those who are seeking to devour us. Why? Because Satan hates the church. He hates it. And we're going to see why this becomes very important. How about magic arts? You'll find it in the book of Acts. A lot of times people talk about uh, you know, magic arts or casting spells and different things. Oh, that's not real. Oh, yes, it is. It's called the power of Satan. And oftentimes, we as Christians, we kind of dismiss that. Oh, it's just play stuff. It's just fake stuff. And No, it's real. And we're going to see, especially with the Apostle Paul, an experience that Paul has with demons. And I think that it's very possible that you and I can experience that as well. And so uh, these are some of the doctrines that we'll be studying or that we'll be hearing about as we go through the book of Acts. So it's a very rich theological book, incredibly rich. And what a powerful, powerful resource we have to learn and to grow and to develop a theology, a system. Theology, simply a system of belief based upon the text of Scripture. So we're always going to allow the text of Scripture to teach us, to instruct us, so that we can then arrive at a theological position. All right. Fourthly, we see the title. We see the time. We see the theology. Let's look at the themes. What are some of the themes that come up in the book of Acts. There are several themes that come up in the book of Acts that are very important. And I'm just going to point out three of them that are highly important. The first theme is the theme of witnessing. The theme of witnessing. Some might call it soul winning, which is fine, because they use the, the, uh, the Proverbs uh, to take that mean that when it's souls is wise. It's not really, that, that text is not actually talking about witnessing, but uh, it's okay, it sounds good, right? And we want to, uh, we want to, you know, I always tell people, you can't win souls to Jesus, but you can lead them to Jesus, okay? Um, soul winning is God's business, ours is soul telling, right? And, and uh, witnessing to them, that's a, a major theme in the book of Acts. And it starts, uh, you can basically break down the book of Acts with the three major uh, components regarding witnessing. Okay? Very simple. Number one, verses one through seven, you can break it down as Jerusalem. Right? It begins there in Jerusalem again, Acts chapter one, and verse number eight says, and ye shall receive power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So, chapters 1 through 7, you find witnessing in Jerusalem. Chapters uh, 8 through 12, you find witnessing in Judea and Samaria. And then chapters 13 through 28, you find witnessing to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, witnessing is a very powerful uh, uh, theme in the book of Acts. And understand this, that the gospel message has the power to save Everyone who believes. Don't ever sit there and think, well, you know, I don't know that they're going to get saved. I, I doubt that they'll get saved. We have no idea of the power. Remember, as we talked about earlier in the doctrine of pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, remember the one who gives illumination? It's not you. You're not the one who is illuminating their mind by the way that you handle witnessing to them. Right? I mean, listen, just because you know the Romans road of salvation doesn't mean that that person's eyes are going to be open. It is the Spirit of God that opens their eyes. 
You have no idea. You may have somebody that you say, you know what, hey, I've been witnessing to them for 28 years, for 30 years, for 50 years. They haven't got saved yet. They won't get saved now. It might be that day. So you don't stop witnessing. And we see that through the, the, the book of Acts. The, the message of the gospel has power to save. Just as Paul would write to the Roman believers in Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So we see uh, that uh, being played out. It's interesting too as you see this being played out. Uh, it's not just for the Jew. It's also for the Gentile. And it's not just for uh, the beggar. It's also for the king. Remember, Paul had opportunity. And Paul said, listen, I, I want to go to the emperor. I want to go there. Why? Because God had already laid it on his heart. God had already revealed to him that what? You are going to preach the gospel to this man. And, and what a powerful thing. So we see the theme of witnessing coming up in the book of Acts. Second theme that we see coming up in the book of Acts is workers. Workers. You will find a number of people actively involved in working or serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to highlight two of them. Two of them. Two main workers in the book of Acts. First of all, perhaps the first few chapters, 1 through 8, is about Peter. And you will find Peter. And I think it's quite interesting, again, as I pointed out last week in the message last week from Matthew chapter 16, perhaps Peter is the primary uh, individual involved in the, the early church or the, the, the beginning of the early church is because Peter is the one who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the one. And so now Jesus says, okay. And what happens to Peter? Peter becomes this incredible preacher. I can't wait for us to study Acts chapter 2 and listen to the sermon that Peter preaches. What a powerful sermon Peter preaches. You will find Peter going into the temple just following that. And he says, hey, what are you doing? Rise up and walk. Come on. Let's get going here. And, and uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, rise up and walk. You see Peter, this bold guy just going forth. And just prior to that, 50, 60 days prior to that, what was he doing? In the garden denying Jesus Christ. What a turnaround in Peter's life. You find in Acts chapter 10, Peter's like, you know what, I, I'm not so sure we should preach to the Gentiles. I'm so certain about this. They're unclean people. And what happens? God gives them a vision of a sheep. Coming down. And God says, Peter, don't you dare call unclean what I've called clean. You preach to them. You reach them. And as a result of that, Acts chapter 15 becomes very important. Why? Because when Paul comes back from his missionary journey and starts telling the church at Jerusalem and the church at Antioch, hey, listen, I want to let you know, man, these Gentiles are getting saved. Oh, no, 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 Paul, you can't be doing this thing. And it was Peter that stepped in and said, oh, Yes, he can, and he has to. What an important person Peter is in the book of Acts. The second major worker in the book of Acts is obviously the Apostle Paul. You will find from chapter 9 on, just Paul just actively involved throughout the book of Acts. And what an incredible study the life of Paul is. What an individual. An individual, you know, sometimes I sit there and I... I, I, I I wonder, does Paul ever have a bad day? You never find Paul with a bad day. Maybe the only time that we could say Paul had a bad day when he was praying three times for his thorn in the flesh to be removed. And then the Lord says, no, Paul, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. And it's almost like, okay, Paul, hey, you guys want to beat me? Come on, beat me. You want to imprison me? Come on, go ahead and imprison me. I can't wait to get to jail to preach to all of them sinners. Right? That was Paul's outlook. That's how Paul was. Paul never looked at his life and said, oh, me, it was what? Lord, use me wherever you want to use me. Or whatever you want to do with me. There's an interesting aspect. And, and 
and it's going to get interesting as we study the book of Acts. Uh, there is one component, one part of the book of, of Acts that comes up where uh, Paul says, hey, listen, I'm going to Jerusalem. And the guys are like, you're not going to Jerusalem because if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be killed. If not killed, then at least in prison. All of us, maybe, I would include myself in that, would be like, yeah, I'm not going to Jerusalem yet. Even a prophet came and said, let me show you what's happening. Here's what's going to happen to this man. He takes a belt and he binds himself. And he says, that's what's going to happen to this man who owns this belt. And it's what? It's Paul. So you would think that people, matter of fact, it becomes a little controversial, okay? I'm going to admit it right now. It becomes a little controversial because some people say, man, God was warning him not to go. I personally don't take that position. And I'll explain it as we get in there. What are fascinating things about the Apostle Paul? Look at Paul's life. Paul was all about Jesus Christ and the gospel. That's what Paul's life was about. Paul didn't care about anything else. What a tremendous man. What a tremendous worker for the cause of Jesus Christ. Tremendous worker. We'll see him uh, in that. And then we find a third uh, theme that comes up in the book of Acts is the theme of firsts. Firsts. I was... In order to keep it alliterated, I was going to do witnessing, workers, and ones. And then spell ones, W-O-N. But I knew you guys would think I was definitely stretching that. So uh, anyway, if you want to use the letter W for first year, worse, I, don't, I just couldn't go with that. But anyway, uh, so what, what do we mean by first? You find the first church or choosing of a church officer in Matthias. How did they choose this officer, Matthias, to replace Judas Iscariot? You find the first sermon being preached in this new era. You find the first conversions of people in this book. You find the first miracle in this new age uh, after the resurrection of Christ. You find the first persecution. You find the first chastisement uh, or judgment of God falling on people. Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 5. You find the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. You find the first sermon by a layman. Acts chapter 7. Who became then a first martyr. Christian martyr. First Gentile converts in Acts chapter 10. First church. Uh, and our first time the name Christian is used or referred to as these people were known. The first apostolic martyr in chapter 12. The first missionary service. The first church council, chapter 15. The first preaching in the continent of Europe taking place. And the first missionary journey going on. Lots of firsts in the book of Acts. And that becomes important. Why? Because the last thing that we want to talk about as we get ready to study the book of Acts is the transition. The transition. We have to understand this transition. And this is going to become important. Why? Because again, as you and I study the book of Acts, we have to keep this in mind. The transition. The book of Acts is a transitional book. You say, what do you mean by that? First of all, it means this. It is the book that bridges the gap between the Gospels and the Epistles. When Paul begins writing letters to the churches, we only know of those churches, why? Because of the book of Acts. We only know that they were to go to these churches because of what? The Gospels. Jesus said, you're to be witnesses, you're to go, you're to preach, you're to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And you are to go to the ends of the earth, all places. Well, the book of Acts is the book that records that. It is a historical book. It gives us data points, but it's also a deeply theological book. And what we have to learn from this book is that this is a book that transitions the Gospels and the epistles. It's that which ties these two things.
things together. It's a very important book. Because of that, we have to understand this, that many events recorded in Acts were never intended to become a pattern for every generation of Christians to follow. If we don't learn that point right there, your theology will be skewed. Why do we have people today that believe in apostles that are available today? Because they don't understand this important point. Why do we have the charismatic gifts in some circles that are believed to be happening today? Because they don't understand this important point. Becomes important for us to understand. This is a transitional book. You say, how do we know that? Because I don't want to just, I don't want my theology. You say, well, because you're a cessationist, which means this. I believe that some of the spiritual gifts have ceased. But I believe that all the gifts of the spirit are available today. I'm a cessationist. They've ceased. <clears throat> Why? Because that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 teaches me. Okay? I'm not uh, a, a, an individual who just says, hey, hey, whatever. Now listen, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit, there are times that the Holy Spirit can't do whatever he wants to do. He can do that. But the Word of God is my guide. Okay? So, what are some examples of some of the things that I, I want to point out with this? Let me point out a couple things. No one today should expect to be personally taught by the resurrected Christ as these apostles were. Don't sit there and think that you are going to have a conversation with Jesus Christ physically. Or maybe even audibly. Acts chapter 9 something happened. People around were blind. Paul was blinded. People around were hearing. Whoa, what happened? There was an interaction with a risen Lord. You have that? No, why? Because it's transitional. How about this? The phenomenon of wind and fiery tongues and or fiery uh, pillar, if you will, over someone's head and tongues speaking. Acts chapter 2. I literally believe that there was fire sitting over their heads. You may sit there and say, We've never seen it. Exactly. We've never seen it. Why? Because the book of Acts is transitional. It's a transitional book. How about this? God does not command us to sell our possessions and become communal like the early church did. They did. What was the problem with Ananias and Sapphira? Now we say, yep, yeah, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because why? The Holy Spirit told them what? Give it. We don't find you. You say, well, why don't we do that? Here's why. The first point is the reason why. The epistles. Don't dismiss the importance of the epistles. The epistles are letters written to the church to instruct us in how we are to govern ourselves. You will never find in the epistles instructions to what? Give up everything you have. You will never find, furthermore, instructions in the epistles other than 1 Corinthians, which was prior to this, where the Apostle Paul instructs them on the gift of tongues. If you have to give the thumb, what's the way that we use this? We don't ever find any other instructions given regarding it. Why? Because the book of Acts is transitional. It's a transitional 
book. How about if we take that same theme of Acts chapter 5 and Ananias and Sapphira? How about deliberate liars? Have you ever seen a deliberate liar struck dead? Acts chapter 5 records it. Why? Because this is a transitional book. Should you expect for an earthquake to happen in your day in order to release you from prison? Well, it happened in Paul's day. Why? Because it's transitional. When you go through the book of Acts and you start reading through these things, be very careful. Understand that the book of Acts, God is doing a new thing. And just because God was doing a new thing does not mean that he wanted to continue to do that new thing through the rest of the church age. You say, how do we know that? We have an Old Testament example of that. When God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, what took place during that time? Earthquake, or if you will, uh, a, a uh, thundering, lightning, we might call it a big thunderstorm or whatever, that happened surrounding that, and boom. I mean, wow, this all took place. When God gave it the second time, none of that happened. Why? God doesn't have to do the same thing every single time. And in the book of Acts, the things that God did then does not mean that he has to do them today. Why? The book of Acts is transitional. And if we don't understand that, we are going to be wondering. And our theology is going to be dictated then by the things that happen in the book of Acts. And so I shared this last week, and I'll share it again. And that is this, here's a key uh, phrase that you want to keep in mind. Acts is formative, not normative. The book of Acts is formative. God is forming this new thing, this new work, what we call church. God is forming it. It's not normative. Not everything that we read in the book of Acts is supposed to take place Today. Keep that in mind. We do not need to be seeking for the same signs and wonders that God did in the early church age to know that God is working today or God is acting today. Not everything in Scripture is to be repeated in our day. So, these are five important aspects as we uh, lay this groundwork. Uh, we're, we want to keep these things in mind as we go through the, the study of the book of Acts. Keep the title in mind. This is a, a, a letter written to, uh, to Theophilus to encourage him to stand in his faith. Uh, this was written uh, over a 30 year period of time prior to the year 64 AD. Uh, the theology, rich in theology, there's so much theology in the, in the book of Acts. Uh, we see uh, then the, uh, the themes that come up, uh, the themes of, of God is calling for workers to witness for him. And, uh, and, and there's a, a bunch of first things that happen. Why? Because it's a transitional book. Keep that in mind. The things that are written in the book of Acts is formative, not normative. So, as we close here tonight, I hope that uh, uh, this groundwork is, is helpful to you as we get into the study of the book of Acts. Such a rich book, such an exciting book. And so the study of the book of Acts is intended to increase our faith in a God who is ever working, or if you will, acting in and around us. It's the book of Acts. God is the actor, not meaning he's playing. Okay, playing a different part. He is the one acting. He is the one actively involved. The one who is uh, working in and uh, in and around us. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he may not actually work in that same way. 
Okay? We want to, again, keep that in mind. So, therefore, we don't want to look for the same signs and wonders that he did during the first century, but we're to trust him to do whatever he deems necessary in our day. Okay, keep that in mind as we study. So, the question really comes uh, back to us, and that is this. Is God at work in our life today? Can you see his activity and actions in your life? Do you see God working? The Apostle Paul makes this profound statement to the Philippian believers. He that began a good work in you will perform it until the day you die. Or you're called home. God wants to do a work. He wants to act. Again, the book of Acts is filled with activity and action. And it is God who is the one at work. Trust that God will be at work in our lives. God will be at work in our church. And as we study this book, that there are things in this book that you're going to say, wow, God, would you please, would you please do this in my life? There are some things that God continues to do, but not everything that God did then will he do today. Hope that's helpful as we jump into this series. Again, this will be a Sunday morning series. And so we're looking forward to it next week, starting off uh, Acts chapter 1 and uh, looking at the resurrected Lord, the risen Lord. What does this mean for us even today as believers in Christ? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word. Thank you so much for, uh, Lord, the, the opportunity that we have, God, to study the book of Acts. And Father, we realize and we know that there are some things that we've studied tonight that are are more on the, the aspect of teaching, instructing, uh, helping us to lay this groundwork. And I pray that you will help us, uh, Lord, to keep some of these things in mind, to understand, uh, God, that you are the one who is at work among us. You are the one who opened our eyes to the gospel. You are the one, God, who saved our wretched soul because you are the one who loved us. Said your only begotten Son to die for us. Father, I pray that you will help us, God, to learn and to grow. God, help us to understand the richness of this book. Father, the theological truths that shape what we believe. I pray that you'll help us. Again, thank you so much for this time. I pray that you'll bless your people. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to have your word in our laps, in our hands. Father, may we dig into your word even this week, anticipating what you will teach us through our study of the book of Acts in Jesus' name.